Hi, ladies and gentlemen, this is Miss Koken. We're back in Chapter 12, this time in Section 2, looking at arcs and chords. We want to apply properties of arcs and chords, and our vocabulary includes central angle arc, minor arc, major arc, semicircle, adjacent arc, and congruent arcs. You've got three warm-up questions to work on, so I'm going to ask you to pause the video and turn it back on when you're ready to check your answers. See you back in a minute. The is over of equals percent over 100 is a throwback to our pre-algebra days. And hopefully you only found number three a tiny bit challenging where we want to find the angle measurement in degrees for angle WVX. And it can be found by knowing that we have 29% of the 360 degrees that's included in that angle. All right, let's move on. A central angle is an angle whose vertex is the center of a circle. You can see in our diagram right here, we've got this angle ABC. Because B is the center of the circle, we can call angle ABC a central angle. And an arc is an unbroken part of a circle consisting of two points, like A and C, and all of the points on the circle between them. So we have an arc AC on our circle with center B, and we would write the measure of angle, I'm sorry, the measure of arc AC is equal to the measure of angle ABC, and that equals X degrees. So a minor arc is an arc whose points are on or in the interior of a central angle, and the measure of a minor arc is equal to the measure of the central angle. So that's why arc AC has the same measure as angle ABC. Then we have something called a major arc, which is an arc whose points are on or in the exterior of a central angle. So you can see that we have angle ABC right here encompassing arc AC. And the central, the, I'm sorry, the um, major arc is around the outside of that so the rest of the circle, and consequently the measure of arc ADC, because it starts at A, goes through point D, and then ends at point C, is equal to 360 degrees minus the measure of angle or measure of arc ABC. So we'll definitely be using that. Then this is an easier concept. If the endpoints of an arc lie on a diameter, such as E and G, then the arc is a semicircle. And the measure of the semicircle, the measure of arc EFG, is 180 degrees. We knew that because it was going to be half of a circle. Let's take a look at example one, where we have a circle graph that shows the types of grass planted in the yards of one neighborhood. And we want to find the measure of arc KLF. KLF starts at K, goes through L, and then ends at F. Pay attention to notation. The measure of arc KLF is going to be equal to, and we know that it is 65% of the entire circle, so we're going to say 0.65, or conversely, we could write 65 over 100, either one will work, times 360 degrees, which represents the entire circle, and that's going to give us the degree measurement of 234 degrees. And that is the measure of arc KLF. Now you can get some practice finding the measure of central angles and finding the measure of arcs. So pause the video while you work on the now you try and turn the video back on when you're ready to check your answers. Since there is a lot going on in the diagram, you may want to highlight what you're looking for for each of the questions. See you back in a minute. So hopefully you didn't have any trouble with this one. I have color-coded the work on the diagram and tried to spell out the work in A, B, and C so that you're able to follow it if you did have any questions about anything. And remember, you can always bring your questions to class. Adjacent arcs are arcs that are both on the same circle that have one point in common. They intersect at exactly one point. So we can see in our diagram that we have arc RS and that that one intersects with arc ST and of course we can see that they meet up at point S. 
So we have something called the ARC Edition Postulate, Postulate 12-1, I'm sorry, dash 2-1. Dash and it reminds us of the Angle Edition Postulate and the Segment Edition Postulate that we learned earlier this year. And basically, it says that the measure of ARC ABC is going to be the sum of the measure of arc AB and the measure of arc BC. So we add two smaller arcs that are adjacent to get the larger arc measurement. That is the arc addition postulate. In example two, we want to use the arc addition postulate to find the measure of arc BCD. Now the arc addition postulate tells us that we can add together arc BC to arc CD to get the total, the measure of arc BCD. However, we don't have those measurements. So let's figure out what we can determine in the meantime. One of the things that we see is we have the measure of angle AFE and the measure of angle EFD. So we can actually add those together and we can see that these three together form a semicircle, and that has the total measurement of 180 degrees. So we can use that to find the measure of angle CFD. That's going to give us a angle measurement of angle CFD of 30.6 degrees, and because we know that the arc CD is going to have the same measurement, we can say that the measure of arc CD is 30.6 degrees. Now we still need to find the measure of BFC so that we can add those two together using the arc addition postulate. And we notice that we've got vertical angles. This and this are vertical, so AFE and BFC are vertical angles, so we do have that measurement and that is 97.4 degrees. We know that the measure of a minor arc is equal to the measure of its central angle, so we are ready to get the total measurement of arc BCD. The measure of arc BCD is going to be the sum of the measure of arc BC and the measure of arc CD, and that is 97.4 degrees plus 30.6 degrees, giving us a total of 128 degrees. Definitely not a hard question, but there were a couple of steps involved for us to be able to find the total arc measurement that we were looking for. You've got a couple of questions to practice on, the now you try, and so you're going to be pausing the video, working on these, and then turning the video back on when you're ready to check your answers. Good luck. So we've talked about the arc addition postulate. Now let's take a look at congruent arcs. Within a circle or congruent circles, congruent arcs are arcs that have the same measurement, like every other congruent item that we've talked about earlier this year, same size, same measurement. So in this case, arc ST is congruent to arc UV, Another way that we'd be able to write that is the measure of arc ST is equal to the measure of arc UV. And theorem 12-2-2 uses some of this information about congruent arc. So let's take a look. In a circle or congruent circles, congruent central angles have congruent chords. So here are the congruent central angles and they have congruent chords. Congruent chords have congruent arcs, so that means if we have congruent chords, then the arcs of the circles are also going to be congruent. And congruent arcs have congruent central angles, so we've really come full circle back to the angles. So basically, when we have congruent arcs, we're going to have congruent chords and congruent central angles. In example three, we want to find the missing measurements. And question A says that segment TV is congruent to segment WS. 
Knowing that information, we want to find the measure of arc WS. And you can see that we have an expression for the measure of the arcs. Since those chords are congruent, then the arcs have to be congruent. And we're going to be able to set that up. We're going to start with the geometry first, but we're going to be able to set that up and solve for n and then plug in to find the missing arc measurement. So if segment TV is congruent to segment WS, then we know that the length TV is equal to the length WS. Then we can substitute in the expressions and solve as we would any other algebraic equation. Once we've got the value of n, we can substitute in to find the measure of arc WS. We could really substitute into either of the expressions because they're congruent. 77 plus 11 gives us 88, so the measure of arc WS is 88 degrees. In question B, we're told that the circle with center C is congruent to the circle with center J, and that is code for their radii are congruent. We're also told that the measure of angle GCD is congruent to the measure of angle NJM. We can see that that's true with the in the arc mark and tick mark that are given to us in the diagram. And what we're interested in finding is the measure of segment, the chord, NM. Knowing that the central angles are congruent tells us that the corresponding arcs and chords are also congruent, and that's how we're going to set it up, using the segment or the chord information. We start out with a congruency statement. Segment NM is congruent to segment DG. We know that that means that the lengths are equal, and then we can substitute in. Once we've got it set up, we can solve, as we do, our algebraic equations and find the, find the value of T. Once we've got the value of T, of course, we're going to substitute back into the expression for the length of chord NM. 5t plus 1, and that's going to give us a length of the chord of 16. On the next page are a couple of problems for you to try using that same theorem. So turn the video off, work on these, and turn the video back on when you are ready to check your answers. Both of these questions were pretty straightforward, so if you have any difficulty with either one of these, definitely bring your questions to class. And we are going to move on to the next set of theorems. These are related, and 12-3, I'm sorry, 12-2-3 says, in a circle, if a radius or a diameter is perpendicular to a chord, so here we have a diameter perpendicular to a chord, here we have a radius perpendicular to a chord, then it bisects the chord and its arc, meaning that this is going to be congruent to this, and this chord or this arc is going to be congruent to that arc. And the 12-2-4 says in a circle, the perpendicular bisector of a chord is a radius. So if we have that perpendicular bisector, then we know that we have a radius or a diameter of the circle. So you can see how these are related. Let's take a look at example four so we can see how to use these two theorems. In example number four, you can see we've got a circle, we've got a perpendicular bisector of a chord, and what we're trying to find is the length of this chord, NP. Now, let's assess what information we've actually got here. We have the length of the radius, which is segment RM, and it is length 17 because it's 8 plus 9. And that means that any radius that we draw is also going to be 17 units long. And with that information, we're pretty excited because we're able to see that we've got a right triangle here. And a right triangle means we can use Pythagorean theorem or we can use SOHCAHTOA to help us solve our problem. If we have the length Rn and we have the length Rs, we are going to use Pythagorean theorem to find the missing length on that right triangle Ns. 
we're trying to find ns, so we're going to solve for that and say that that's going to be equal to rn squared minus rs squared. Then, of course, we know we're going to take the square root of both sides, and we're ready to substitute in. 289 minus 64 gives us 225, which is the square of 15. So NS has a length of 15 units. SP is the same length because it was a bisected chord. And so what that means is we have come full circle and we know the length NP is 15 plus 15 or 30. Being able to use a right triangle here was super powerful. And I recommend that that's how you approach the now you try. And first of all, of course, label your work. Make sure you've assessed what you've got. And turn the video back on when you're done and you're ready to check your answer. So for the now you try, we did not get a nice round number. We either have a length QR of 20 times the square root of 3 or approximately 34.6 rounded to one decimal place. That is the last problem for this lesson and you're ready to work on your homework. Anything that you have had any trouble with, please bring it to class so we can talk it over. And I'll see you back in lesson three.